Amen. Uh, it's Christmas time. As you can see, the, everybody got together last night and made our church beautiful. I love Christmas time. I love the decorations. I love the songs. I love the parties. I love the gifts. You know, you really got to enjoy those. And uh, I love that uh, we here waited until after Thanksgiving to set up Christmas. We have, you know, I love Christmas. I tell you all that every year, go on and on about it. But we have a, a very strict rule in our house that we do not allow Christmas to invade our home until after Thanksgiving, right? I see like two of you who agree with me. The rest of you already got your houses decorated and all that stuff. Okay, there we go. We got to... So, you know, I don't judge those who had their decorations up last week. Um, I mean, I do. I just don't voice it out loud when, when people do that. No, I, I really don't care. But um, I, I do love this season. And what's so fascinating to me about it is that as a, a culture, as a nation, everybody seems to love Christmas. It seems like the whole nation is just geared towards December 25th. I think it was July this year that I saw the first Christmas decorations go up in the stores for people to buy and all that stuff. And then month of December, everything is just focused on December 25th, all of your ads, all of your activities. It's all about getting to that day. That's the culmination of the Christmas season. And uh, it's, it's odd to me, though, that, that we do that because Christmas is actually the celebration of the start of a journey, not the end of a journey. And so I want us, over these next several weeks, we're going to pause our Isaiah study, and I want us to study through the book of Luke so that we can see that as we're coming down to December 25th, that what we celebrate is the start of God's salvation. Uh, the Gospels are very clear that, that Jesus came for a purpose. And I can assure you, having read the Gospels, that that purpose has nothing to do with a fat guy in a red suit that breaks the law uh, by breaking in everybody's homes once a year. Nothing to do with that. Jesus was focused. He had a, a specific goal that he was shooting for, and I guarantee you that, that his focus was not on Bethlehem. It was on Jerusalem, on a cross, on a tomb that he would borrow for a few days. And so we're going to look through the Gospel of Luke over the next four weeks, and we're going to see this develop throughout the Gospel of Luke, this focusing in on Jerusalem, on Jesus' purpose, on specifically what Jesus came to do. So I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter to this morning, and we're going to see what Jesus came to reveal this morning, that he came to reveal God's salvation, his judgment, and his faithfulness. Christmas is wonderful, but all of this stuff really means nothing if Jesus didn't actually come for these purposes and accomplish these goals. So let's pray, and then we're going to dive into God's word together. Holy God, we do come before you, and I pray that the song we sung would actually be an outflowing of our hearts, that we would adore you, that we would delight in you, that we would stand in awe of who you are and what you have done. You are the Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, who speaks and life comes forth. And I thank you, Lord God, for speaking that life in the life of a sinner like me. I thank you, Lord God, that this room is filled with sinners who have been redeemed. We come now to your word, and I pray that this time would be good for us, that it would be pleasant, that it would be delightful, that it would be convicting, that it would be encouraging. I pray, God, that your word would produce abundant fruit in our hearts, in our lives, and that we would change accordingly to what we were to hear this morning. I ask for ears to hear your voice. I ask for, for eyes to see your purposes in the scriptures today. I pray for hearts that are ready to believe. But Lord, more than anything, I pray that you would be glorified. All things exist for your glory. We are here for your glory today. So I pray 
that you would remove the weakness of this preacher, that you would remove the distractions of all of our lives, that you would remove all of those things that would take our eyes off of you and that, and that you would cause your name to be magnified, that you would glorify yourself here in our midst today. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 22. We're going to skip over the birth narratives. You're going to get plenty of that over this Christmas season. And we're going to go to an infancy narrative that is often overlooked, I think, uh, in this season. Uh, this event takes place more than likely in between the birth of Jesus with the shepherds and all of that in the coming of the Magi to see Jesus. Uh, at some point um, after this event, the, the wise men are going to come and they'll go off to, to Egypt after that. So this, this takes place, this event, about 40 days after the birth of Jesus. We're going to see the uh, faithfenness of Mary and Joseph to carry out the law and, re and requirements for the baby Jesus. But we're going to see some very important prophecies and proclamations that give us insight into who this baby truly is. So if you'll begin reading with me in chapter 2, verse 22, it says, When the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to sacrifice the sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So uh, if you go back and you look at the law of Moses, we find out that uh, it was a 40-day period when a woman would have a son. After 40 days, both mom and child had to go and get uh, purified, ritually cleansed so that uh, they could continue to be a part of the covenant community. And so Mary and Joseph, they're in Bethlehem, a few miles south of Jerusalem. They take baby Jesus up there 40 days uh, to carry out the law. And uh, they do this not simply for the purification, but he quotes here saying about the firstborn male that opens every womb. It's got to be called holy to the Lord. And uh, if you go back in Exodus, you'll read about when God delivers Israel out of Egypt. He kills all the firstborn of Egypt. He says to Israel, because I took their firstborn, uh, I put them to death for your sake, I get all of your firstborn. Now, you can kill the cattle if you want, but you're supposed to redeem the sons. You're supposed to buy them back, and so you present them as holy to the Lord. This is the firstborn, and you're supposed to buy back the firstborn, redeem the firstborn. At no point in history... Has a child been presented to the Lord in a more appropriate manner than when they present the Holy Son of God to the Lord? Not merely as an act like we do here with baby dedications. Yes, this baby will, will be trained up in the ways of the Lord. But as a child whose whole point and purpose in coming into this world is to serve the Lord. And so they present Jesus as the holy child, uh, the firstborn who's going to serve the Lord. One other thing I want to point out, I think this is significant for what we're about to see, is that they offer the sacrifice according to the law, and then Luke quotes for us, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Well, what's significant about this is that that's actually not the first law about this whole situation. Uh, the, the actual law states in Leviticus 12 uh, that a one-year-old lamb has to be put up for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. So that's, you're supposed to have a lamb and a bird, and that's the, the offering you've got to make for the child. But Moses then goes on to say, if you can't afford that, if you're too poor to afford the lamb, then you have two birds, for one for the burnt offering and one for the, 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 uh, the sacrifices. So you, you have this idea that Mary and Joseph are not very well off. They're actually a poor couple, and they're coming into the temple to present an offering that everybody else who sees it's going to know this is a poor couple. This is not a well-to-do couple. On a side note, I do think it's important that with Jesus, a lamb was not sacrificed because he is the lamb. But that's a whole nother sermon, so we're not going to go down that road. All right, so we got this poor couple coming into Jerusalem, presenting their firstborn son uh, according to the laws of Moses. And as they, they're just going, business is normal. This is just what you're supposed to do if you're a good, law-abiding Jew. Business is usual. Verse 25, nothing usual about this. It says, there was a man 
in Jerusalem, whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So here we have this guy, Simeon. There's a couple of things, that are, a few things that are said about Simeon. First of all, he's a righteous man which means that he is a man who has structured his life according to the ways of God, and he's tried to live out his faith, might be how we would say it. He does what's right. Second, he's a devout man. This word means to be a God-fearer. So it's not that he's righteous because he thinks that's what gets him prestige or gets him honor or gets him favor with God, but he fears God. He knows God's a holy God and that the holy God has called Simeon to follow his ways. And so he follows the ways of God, not for selfish reasons, but for really the reason all of us should, knowing who God is. So this is a true believer in the Lord who is allowing that relationship with God to fuel his life. Not only that, he's also an expecting believer. He's looking and expecting for the consolation or the comfort of Israel. We've read in our study of Isaiah how God has promised to comfort his people. Isaiah 40, verse 1, comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says the Lord. And, and so Simeon is here looking for it, expecting that comfort, that, that, that promise to come about through, the God, through God's Messiah or the anointed one, the Christ. And so he, he's, he's looking for this, and the Holy Spirit is also upon him and has told him, Simeon, you're not going to die until you see the Christ. That's a big deal. We're talking hundreds of years that God has been promising this Messiah, Isaiah, that we've been studying through. Hundreds and hundreds of years before this day, Isaiah had said, this guy's coming, this Messiah's coming, and Israel's been looking for and waiting for the Christ. And, and here's Simeon, and the Holy Spirit says, you're going to die after you see him in your lifetime. That would be like God coming to us and saying, don't worry, Jesus is coming back you before you die. I mean, that's an exciting thing. We're, yes, we're ready. We want to see this. He's looking for it, and God says, I'm going to satisfy the desire of your heart and show you the Christ. Now, who on earth could this possibly be? He's brought into the temple. All sorts of people come into the temple for all sorts of reasons. Simeon has the Holy Spirit guiding and directing him, and he comes into the temple with all of those different people there. There had to have been people of power and position and wealth and money, of all of those different people there. Uh, it had to be people of strength and military ability and might. He went to none of them. The Holy Spirit took him to a poor couple with a little baby and said, that's it. Now, you know, it, it's kind of awkward when, when strangers come up to you with your newborn baby and just rip them out and, and, and you know, they're so cute and whatnot. So imagine Mary and Joseph, they, they, they've already seen some weird things with this, with this child, some very amazing things with this child from the very start with angelic revelations and shepherds coming and saying, you won't believe what we just heard, but we had to come and see all sorts of things. And now on top of all of that, they have this old guy coming to them and so they're just going about their, 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 their religious devotion to God, coming and taking the child out of their hands and looking at the child and saying this about the child saying that my eyes have seen your salvation. He quotes from Isaiah, light of revelation to the Gentiles, uh, glory of Israel. He, he looks at this child and he takes the child and says, this child is God's salvation who's going to provide a light to the Gentiles who don't know about the promises and provide the glory to Israel who does know about the promise of God's salvation. 
What's so significant here for us that, that, that I really want us to, to understand is that salvation is not seen by Simeon as a product of Jesus' life. Salvation is not understood by Simeon as something that Jesus just gives out to people. Your eyes will not be closed, Simeon, in death until you see the Christ. And when he sees the Christ, he says, my eyes have seen salvation itself. Jesus is God's salvation. Why is there this belief in Christianity that there is no salvation outside of Jesus? I mean, in our pluralistic society and world, it would be a lot simpler and, and a lot easier for people to swallow if we said Jesus is the best way, but you got other ways that you can be saved. We would be a lot more popular in American society if we embrace that. We'd be ignored, as we see in other denominations, but, you know, we'd be uh, a little less hated, I guess. But we don't do that. We say, because we believe in the Scriptures, there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. And people say, well, that's arrogant of you. That's, that's just wrong of you to say that these other people who are good people, who live good lives according to their ways, are going to go to hell forever because they don't believe in your Jesus. We say that there is no other way to salvation but through Jesus because Jesus is salvation itself. The Bible is so clear that you can't separate the two. It's not merely that Jesus gains us salvation. He gains us forgiveness. He gains us the Holy Spirit. But when he comes to bring salvation, he does that by giving us himself. And it's only when we know Jesus and only when we have this relationship, with Jesus, it's only when we have Jesus that we have salvation. This is what Jesus came to reveal to us about God's salvation. It's not when you have a good enough life put together, you look nice and you, you do nice things. It's not about when you have a rich enough life that you've obtained and you've prospered and, and therefore you've really ha have gained what you need in life. It's not about when we go into these other cultures and societies and try to lift them up out of poverty, that that's salvation. That's not salvation. It's not about when we deliver people from addiction and we help them come out of their addiction. That's not salvation. Salvation is Jesus Christ. And when people come to know Jesus, they know God's salvation. Whether they're impoverished in a third world country, or they're sitting on top of a pile of money, whether they're sick and on their deathbed or they're in the prime of their health, whatever they might be in life, if they know Jesus, they know salvation. But the problem is, not everybody's going to know Jesus. And this drives people nuts. It makes people so, so angry. So God would send people to hell just because they don't know Jesus or because they just don't buy into the whole Christian belief system. Jesus came to reveal more than just salvation. He came to reveal judgment. I want to look at the rest of what Simeon has to say because it's so very, very important. But if you look at me in verse 33, he continues to speak uh, to, to Mary and Joseph. But first we have this little note. It says his father and his mother were amazed about the things which were being said about him. I mean, there's just no end to all the miraculous and wonderful things that are being said about this Christ child. Simeon is amazing them. And so Simeon says he blesses them, and he says to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. I can only imagine the, the confusion that Mary and Joseph must have had with all these things being said about Jesus, all these things being said about Jesus, the way Jesus came about. And so they're, they're, they're astounded by this, and, and Simeon turns his attention, and he says, I want you personally to understand who this child is. 
He says, this child has been appointed by God, and it is for two things. First of all, he's going to cause the rise and the fall of many in Israel, and then second, he's going to be assigned to be opposed. Those two are, th- are really just two things together. In, in the Old Testament, we have God saying that he's going to set up his Messiah as a sign post so that people will see him and they'll know how to come and find that, that consolation, that comfort, that forgiveness, that hope, that, that salvation. And so he says, this is the sign. Jesus is set up as the sign, but it's not going to be a pleasant experience. I'm beholding the child who is God's salvation. He is the light to the nations. He is the glory of Israel. But I want you, Mary, to understand that he is going to be opposed and rejected. And he is going to... Uh, be appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. The fall meaning the spiritual judgment to death, the rise meaning the judgment to life. And then he turns to Mary and he says, in in you, I want you to understand this child who's going to be appointed for the fall and rise, judgment for death, judgment for life of many, who's going to be assigned to be opposed. I want you to understand he's also going to be a sword that is going to pierce your very soul and he's going to reveal the hearts of many. Now, some people see this as a statement to uh, Mary that basically is saying uh, that um, you are going to be hurt by what happens. You have uh, the crucifixion that's going to come up and happen, and, and uh, you know, Mark's singing beautifully, Mary, did you know, it's one of the, do you know what's going to happen to you? Did you see your baby boy hanging on a cross, being rejected by your highest leaders hated and despised with blood just covering his entire body as he gives up his life. The kind of pain and affliction that that would cause to a mother, I can't even imagine. But, but I think that the way that, that we see this used throughout Scripture, this idea of piercing through to the heart and the soul, that it's more than just emotional pain, but that it's that even you, Mary, are not going to avoid what this child came to show. He came to reveal the hearts of many. Jesus is a sword that pierces through, cuts past, breaks through all of the religious piety and all of the superficial acts of integrity that we do to hide who we are from everybody else. You sit in a room filled with people who wear a face today that it tries to disguise what's going on on the inside. We all do it. None of us want to expose the very depths of our heart or our soul to other people. And we can get away with that with most everybody. Most everybody in your life you can pretend with. There might be a few people who can see through it. But with Jesus, you can't get away with that. Jesus cuts through all of that junk, all of those excuses, all of those facades, and he reveals what's truly inside. So that when people reject Jesus, Jesus is simply sowing what's already in their heart. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 3. He says, he who believes in in him, in Jesus, uh, is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. This is the judgment that the light, Jesus, has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. You know, how a co- you know how you can know that a cockroach hates light? You turn on the light. You don't know that in the darkness that they hate light. It's not until the light comes on. They're, oh, they're all scattered. They don't like it. When Jesus comes and all of a sudden the darkness gets all upset and starts raging and and spitting and fighting and hating him, it's not that he made them that way. It's not that he's just the agitator. He's the revealer who shows what's really in their heart. When God steps on the scene and sinful humanity who hates God in their heart rejects him, they're simply demonstrating who they are, even if Jesus wasn't there to show it. When people come to Christ and they're so broken that they just, they know that they need a Savior and they, they put their faith in Christ and, and he ri- appoints them for a rise, for resurrection, he's just showing what's going on in their heart. The faith that God gives them so that they can come to him. Jesus reveals the judgment of God, the necessity for it, and the reality of it. He doesn't make us sinners. He just shows us to be what we are. 
this past summer in Poland, we had a uh, uh, we did our youth camp there for for the church, and uh, Brother Ted did the games. Wonderful job with the games, and he had one game, a uh, food game. And uh, I I can say I've never seen a man so happy and pleased to deceive youth into eating nasty things uh, than Brother Ted. Uh, I, I asked him if I could share this beforehand, but uh, he was so happy and giddy as he put together this deal, and my wife helped them, and they did a terrific job. What they did, basically, is they took two food items that looked similar. I mean, on the outside, you definitely tell they're different, but then they covered them with the same substance, so you, you don't know what's actually on the inside. They both had the same outside covering, and it's not until you take a big old bite that you know what's on the inside, and Ted got so happy as he thought about a kid biting into an onion instead of an apple, you know, or, or eating toothpaste instead of Oreo filling and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, and it was, it was wonderful. Some, some of the things had to tell, like the ice cream you could tell because it started to melt that it wasn't mashed potatoes. Uh, one little girl got tricked with that, and she ended up loving the, the mashed potatoes. It was really weird. But uh, the, the point is, you know, the, the inside's there. I mean, it's either an apple or an onion, but the outside covers it, and you don't know what's on in the inside until you take, take the plunge, until you take the bite. Well, Jesus is the bite. Jesus is the one that reveals. Jesus is the one who shows what's, what's here. And, and, and you may not even know what's on the inside until Jesus steps into your life and shows you. And the light comes in and shines and shows you the darkness of your very soul. And I, I think that he's saying not even you, Mary, are going to be able to escape the revelation of this child. And what's the revelation? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us by nature, children of wrath, dead in our sins. Jesus comes into the world as a light, but we need to understand that light as a judging light that looks at you and says, this is who you really are. And it's painful to see. It's why a lot of people reject Christianity because they don't like to be shown who they are. It's why a lot of Christians reject a lot of this book because Jesus in his word shows us who we are. We, we don't like this. So let's rip this out. Let's rip that out because we don't want to see it. Turn the light out. But you can't turn Jesus off. He shows us who we are. And if you want the salvation, you have to have him. And in order to have him, you have to face who you are. But the beautiful thing about it is that when we're willing to let this sword pierce our own souls and show us for who we are, we can find the faithfulness of God and Jesus Christ to forgive sinners like us. Let's finish this passage with another person, uh, verse 36, Anna, whose name means grace. And there was a prophetess, Anna, daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So Anna, we don't know just a lot about her. We do know that she was an elderly lady who had spent most of her life as a widow. The text could either be read that she was married for seven years and then widowed for 84 years, or that she was married for seven years and had lived as a widow all of that time, and she was now 84 years. So she's either 84 or like 105. Either way, <laughs> she was a woman who spent all of those years seeking God. Fasting and praying are not two activities you do if you think everything's all right, I don't have any problems. Fasting and praying is what you do when you know you need God, and so you're, you're actively seeking the Lord. That's why in our prayer request time at church, when people are like, oh, I'm good, I don't have anything to pray about. You know, they're either a liar, or they don't want to tell you all the bad things that are going on for their own personal reasons, but you know there's something there because we all need God and prayer is the way that we communicate that to God. So this is a woman who knows that she needs God, who's looking for God, she's expecting it, 
Uh, her audience are all those who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. We could say she's probably one of those. Simeon was one of those. And you have this woman who's a prophetess in the temple, day and night, fasting and praying for year after year after year after year after year. And the text makes it very clear that, that all of this is happening simultaneous. So, so Joseph and Mary bring Jesus into the temple. And at the time that they bring Jesus in, so before they can even get the offerings done, the time they bring Jesus in to do these things, that's when Simeon comes up and he takes the baby and he says the wonderful things and the well, very challenging things that he says about what this child's going to do. And at that time, as Simeon is making his prophecy about Jesus, Anna comes up and she hears, presumably, what Simeon says. And so she knows that this child is the one that we have been waiting for all of this time. And so she begins to proclaim what Simeon has prophesied about baby Jesus. Don't have anything that she says about it other than the fact that she gives thanks to God and she speaks to these uh, others who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And we could say that this is just simply nationalism. These are people who want to see Jerusalem freed from Roman tyranny and oppression. But I think that it's more than that. Because it's not merely that Rome is in Jerusalem. It's that sin is still in Jerusalem. If you go and you look at the Old Testament, uh, this Greek word that's used for give thanks, it's only used one time in the New Testament, one time in the Hebrew Old Testament. And it's used in a psalm that talks about how Jerusalem has been destroyed by her enemies, Psalm 79, how, how they have just devastated everything and they, they're praying for God to vindicate them, to save them, to come to their rescue. And the psalm ends with confidence saying, we give thanks to you, God, because we know you're going to do these things. I think Luke chooses this word. It's a, it's a unique word in the New Testament and the Old Testament. I think he chooses this word to connect us with that, to say that this is a woman who is giving thanks because she is seeing the vindication that the psalmist was praying for so long ago. And she begins to share with other people who are also looking for this redemption that God had promised so long ago. Now, we're in Jerusalem in the first century. This is pre-AD, or 70 AD, meaning... The city's standing. The walls are up. The city has never been so well fortified as what we have in Herod's temple in that period. The temple's standing. She's there in the temple. So it's not like after it was destroyed by the Babylonians and they're just looking at the wreck and the ruin of Jerusalem. They already have a restored and redeemed Jerusalem on the surface. I think that she's looking for something more. I think that she's looking for the promises that God makes that it's not simply going to be a city with power and with walls and with a structure, but it's going to be a city with God in it and sin removed from it. I think that this redemption we're talking about that she's looking for and that Simeon's looking for is the new heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem kind of redemption that we're talking about. I think she's looking for the hope of Israel, which is freedom from sin and death. And she sees in this child, through what Simeon's saying, that God's finally going to bring it to pass. And she gives thanks, and she starts telling other people about it. Now, I think this is important for us, because Jesus came not in a vacuum. He didn't come in, in a, a historical setting that nobody was expecting. He came as a fulfillment of God's promises. So that when people look at Jesus, they can see the faithfulness of God at work. Because God promises, God will act. But let's face it, sometimes it gets a little difficult to see it. Sometimes in life it gets a little difficult to see God's faithfulness, and this is what drives people to say, God, where are you? How You failed me in this. I don't know what's going on with this. And people begin to doubt his faithfulness. The Jews for hundreds of years have been told these promises of this coming Messiah, and, and these select few have still been waiting for it and still looking for it and still expecting. And when they see Jesus, they see God's faithfulness in flesh, in a baby. Because God promises he will act. Because God promised Jesus came. Jesus is the faithfulness of God so that believer, unbeliever, whoever you are this morning, if you wonder, where is God? If you wonder, is he faithful? 
because I hear all of these things that preachers say, and I read all of these things that God said, and I just fail to see it. If you have a struggle with the faithfulness of God, look to Jesus. Because the Christian hope is not a worldly hope. Your worldly hope is a baseless hope. Worldly hope is, oh, I hope this works out. It's all based on uncertainty. But this is the outcome I want, and so I, I'm going to hope that it will happen. I have no idea. Christian hope is not based on uncertainty. It is based on a historical event of Jesus of Nazareth. Christian hope is based on something that's already happened. So our hope is not unfounded, and our hope is not shakable. Our hope is Christ crucified, risen from the dead. It's already happened. God's already proven himself faithful. These people were looking for, waiting to see, and they see Jesus. This is it. We can look back with a greater confidence and a greater assurance because Jesus has already saved us. He's already paid the price. He's already demonstrated at the culmination of time and space that God is faithful and able to save, that he is just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. Jesus is the revelation of God's faithfulness. So don't look to your situation to see if God is faithful to you. Look to Jesus. I love Christmas. I love the decorations and the color and the lights. But my friends, Christmas is merely the beginning of a story. And that story ends with an empty tomb, a glorified Jesus, and if you believe in him, eternal life for you. Let's spend this Christmas season remembering what it's really all about. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that while we were in the darkness that you came to us, you showed your light to us. In our hearts, you showed us who we are. I thank you, God, for that painful revelation for me and for your faithfulness to forgive those who turn to you, that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord Jesus, we turn to you now and ask that you reveal yourself to us. For those here who need hope in a season where everybody's celebrating and rejoicing, but in their heart there is only sorrow and pain, grant them hope by showing them yourself. I pray that you would grant strength to those who are in a season of weakness and burden that weighs so heavily upon them they don't know how they're going to make it another day. That you would grant them strength by putting their burdens on your shoulder, taking them by the hand and leading them. For those, Lord God, this morning, who need purpose and meaning to get up day after day after day, that you would show them yourself, that they might place their eyes on you and know that your name is worthy to be glorified and as long as we have breath, that we have a purpose and a meaning of life, which is to proclaim the name of Jesus. Lord God, provide light to those who are lost. Provide glory to your people here today. We ask, Lord God, Jesus, to give us yourself that in you we might find what our souls long for and need. It's in your name I pray. I want to invite us this morning to begin our Christmas season right. We're going to get caught up in all of the materialism and all of the special atmospheres and even in the family and, and all the things that Christmas is going to bring. Some of you, it's going to be a painful time, and I understand that. 
Some of you, is going to be a joyous time. You get to see family or friends you haven't seen in a long time. Some of you, it's just going to be a busy time. You're going to be glad when it's over. Let it be a worshipful time for us. Because Jesus came to give us salvation, to, to, to show that judgment, to show God's faithfulness, but he did all of it by giving us himself. And if you don't have Jesus, then you have nothing. Whatever you celebrate this season, you have nothing. So my invitation to you is not try to find all these things you want, but find Jesus today. Give him your life. Ask him to come into your heart and your life. I'll be down here to pray with you if that's the decision that you want to make. But for the rest of us, let's just get our hearts right and thank God for sending Jesus to begin a journey that ends with an empty tomb. Stand with me. Let's sing.